In today's show, I'm going to talk about setting up a fantasy league, what the settings are, what they mean, what's best, what's bad, all that stuff. Hopefully we cover it all. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and we're available on all platforms. I'm recording this one in advance. So hopefully at this point, I'm trying to, when you listen to this, I'm trying to ski without dying. So, fingers crossed that I don't do that. So, if something does break, Kevin Durant, Miles Turner, Donovan Mitchell, who knows? Kyrie Irving, Russell Westbrook, who knows if any of these guys get traded? I can't react to it live as if it just happened. We'll cover it next week. What I thought I would do here is go through some settings for leagues and how to set them up, specifically for redraft leagues. Some of this stuff applies to Dynasty. I probably will do a Dynasty setup league Um, show anyway, but this one applies to redraft leagues. And I think I'm going to cover most things. There might be some things that slip through the cracks because I can't go onto Yahoo at the moment and check their settings and set up a league because they shut down. Oh, well, that's just what happens, isn't it? One of the first things you've got to choose is where you're going to host the league. And there are upsides and downsides to all of them. The three major ones are Yahoo, ESPN, and Fantrax. You also have CBS. You also have Sleeper. Um, just to quickly run through, yeah, Yahoo is the most popular for sure, but there are a lot of things and settings on that on that format that I hate, that I really you know, need need adjusting. Their um, their inability to cut a player once a game has started is frustrating having to wait for a certain time of day to add players onto your roster is annoying. Not being able to make those ch- those free agency changes when something happens is a frustrating limitation of the Yahoo system. ESPN, they don't even add the correct players to their database. Position eligibilities for all sites can be really weird. Injury designations and having to wait for IL status status or O status. And the Yahoo one is probably, I don't know if it's worse than ESPN. It's pretty bad having to wait for someone gets game time decision or O or IL or whatever situation they want to do. It's pretty frustrating. Fantrax, I think, covers all of those. In terms of running a league and having the options, it's clearly the best. But the user experience and the interface, it's nowhere near as good as using Yahoo or even ESPN. It's a lot clunky. I know they're doing a lot of work on it and it takes a lot more to get used to it, but it is nowhere near as appealing. CBS, I don't know why you would... Sorry to anyone from CBS who's watching this. I don't know why you would choose CBS to host your league. I just don't see any positive that it brings there personally. And then when you head to Sleeper, again, I don't know why you would host a fantasy basketball league on Sleeper. I think Sleeper is a terrible format. I think the user interface and how it all looks is great. The draft room is really nice. All that stuff is slick. But the fact that they restrict it to points leagues only, their default point setting, I believe, includes ejections and technical fouls, which are just horrific settings. Um, and the only thing you can do is game pick, where you pick one player, one game per player per week, which just isn't how basketball works. It just isn't. And it institutes so much more of an element of luck and chance into a game where there's already a huge selection of that. So Sleeper could become the best really easily. They just need to institute more more options, categories, and get rid of the fact that you have to stick to game pick. Have it as an option by all means. Have that as an option. People can choose it. But restricting it to say, we know fantasy basketball. We are the best. We are inventing it now and telling you this is what the best is is ridiculous. When I think, in fact, the system is pretty terrible of just picking one game for a player a week. It's just not how basketball is played. 
You don't have to make basketball, fantasy basketball into fantasy football because it's not the same game. And that's why I would never choose to play a league on Sleeper. Again, the, the, the base of a good system is there. It just isn't. So there's ups and downs with everything, with all of these. Fantrax, ESPN, Yahoo, Sleeper, CBS. Some of them have more downs than ups. There's your basis of the sites, the five main sites. Did I miss someone? I don't think I missed any sites. So they're, they're the main five. Well, they're the five that I've ever played on anyway. There is actually, that's not true, because there is like NFBKC, which is uh, unfortunately not available to Australians to play anymore. That's not a bad uh, setup, especially if you are in the States or in Canada and you're looking for high paid leagues. NFB, NF, NFBKC is a really good place to go and do that. So I, I would highly suggest that. And of course, um, when you are looking for leagues, if you're looking for money leagues, Fantasy Basketball International, they run the best leagues in the world. Go and hit those up. I think, it's, I think they've got a site now called fantasybasketballinternational.com where you can find all that, plus their Discord, at Hidden Upside on Twitter. He'll have the link there. And at NBA Dynasty ADP has the links as well. So when you're looking for new leagues. But this is when you're starting a league. When you're the one starting it, what do you need to do? Oh, should I? Yeah. You know what? Let's just get this out of the way now because I need some energy. I need to talk about Built Bar. Have you tried Built Bar Puffs yet? You should. And if you haven't, you're just you're depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. You could be kicking back right now, listening to Locked On Fantasy Basketball and smashing down a Built Bar Puff. In fact, their cookie dough chunk puff is back and it's light with a chewy texture, real cookie dough chunks, and of course, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. Cookie dough chunk puffs are only 160 calories and 15 grams of protein. That is a huge protein to calorie ratio. Love it. Run to built.com. You can snag a box for you and your family. It'll be the perfect treat. And it's great when you're hitting, heading back from the gym and you need to get those proteins into your body and do it deliciously. You're going to love the new cookie dough chunk puff. Whenever you need a snack for your workout, a late night treat, or just to grab a quick bite, Built is the perfect protein bar and they taste better than a candy bar. Ditch the calories, the fat, and the sugar. Grab yourself a Built bar. Go to built.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. The promo code is LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5. Of course, Built bar is... Built different. All right. What type of league is it? Basic question. Are you running a categories league? Are you running a rotisserie league, which is categories? I should have said, yeah, and sometimes these terms get into change. We don't know what we're talking about. In, in general, in general, if someone says it's a head-to-head league, it's head-to-head categories. If someone says it's a categories league, they're talking about head-to-head categories. If someone says it's a roto league, well, it's always a, a category league. Um, if someone says it's a points league, it's a points league. If you reference, and it's just it's very hard to get all this terminology the same, and this is just how I feel it is, and I think it's probably the best way to speak about it. If you say you're in a head-to-head league, that means categories. If you're in a points league and you call it a head-to-head league, you're going to get into a lot of confusion with asking for advice. Head-to-head or categories means 9-cat, 8-cat, 11-cat, whatever you want. Roto means roto, and points means points. The confusion comes when people say, I'm in a head-to-head league, and they mean points. Like that's where, Or I'm in a rotisserie category league, where because you know, in the past, category leagues in baseball, when it all started back in the day, used to be just called rotisserie. So that's where the confusion goes. Category, head-to-head categories. Head-to-head, head-to-head categories. Roto, roto, points, points. I think that's the best way of um, defining them just to limit, limit confusion. Now, I'm not going to talk about what categories to use or what point system to use in this show. There are myriads of different things. You could run a 7-cat league, 5-cat, 9-cat, 11-cat, 13-cat, throw a whole bunch of exotic formula, formulas and categories and true shootings and offensive rebounds and game-winning shots and whatever nonsense you want to put in there. You can do whatever you want. You know, there's pros and cons of all that, but that's another hour of discussing every single category. And I did a fair bit of that stuff a couple of days ago anyway. And, you know, oh yeah, if I tweak the, the standard points format, I can get things to be more realistic, which is just not true because in the end, what's what's realistic? What does any of that mean? Like, in the end, whatever point system you do, whether it punishes for missed shots or doesn't or soups up the value of defensive stats or whatever it is, it is what it is. And you judge those players based on the fantasy points they produce. I think sometimes, and I can be, I'm guilty of this too, is that we get so bogged down in trying to mirror real life when real life rankings and the good players is highly subjective and variable anyway. 
So what? And it's, it gets to my argument with drafting and the best player available. Like, there's, that's not a set thing. The best player is not a set thing. It's it's subjective so much of the time. So striving to find or striving to get to a marker which is constantly moving around, I feel like sometimes wastes a lot of our time. Anyway, but you do have to make that choice. Are you playing categories, head to head? Are you playing rotisserie or are you playing points? There's your number one decision. Points is usually better for beginners, better for people who don't want their fantasy leagues to be as intense or as draining on your mental capacity with builds and all that sort of stuff. As a general rule, you might say, I love fantasy, I'm super into it, and points is best for me. Great, fine, no problem. As a general rule, a points league are more for beginners, more for people who want an easier or simpler time in running their fantasy league in general. Right, so if you are someone who wants that and is coming in, that may be where you want to start. But generally pushing it up to categories is an extra challenge. And maybe even Roto, some would consider is a higher challenge than head-to-head categories. Different sort of game involved. I'm not going to go into all the differences of those games here. And again, whatever categories or points format you choose, that's completely up to you. And it's not really in the scope of what we're doing um, on this show. So there are your three main things. With something like um, points as well, a points league, you can do it where you have um, head-to-head weekly matchups, or you can have just who scores the most fantasy points for the entire season. So total points. That is probably the worst format you can get, I reckon. Having just like who just accumulates the most points over a season. There's no head-to-head matchups. It's one of the worst. I think it's the worst format there is. But it is something that exists. How many teams are in your league? Okay. You got to make that call. In general, a 12 team league is probably the sweet spot. 14 is fine. 10 is probably too low. 6 is definitely too low. 4 is ridiculously too low. 8 is pushing it. If you are in a situation where, hey, look, you know what? I've only got five mates who like playing fantasy basketball, so we've got a six team league. Okay. I get that, right? I'd also suggest that you guys either try and recruit other people or go and join something like Fantasy Basketball International. Hey, that's free to join, by the way. And find yourself bigger leagues to play in. More, real, not more, not realistic, but more um, competitive or larger size leagues. But when you are deciding on how many teams you have, I would aim for, at minimum, 150 players rostered. If you're in a 10-team league, that means 15 players per roster. The default on most sites is 13. So you've got to make make some tweaks. If you're running an eight-team league, you're looking at you know, 17 players per roster. Does that work out? I don't even know. That's, maybe it's 18 players per roster. If you're in a four-team league, well, you're going to need a lot more players just because you don't want, I don't think, the waiver wire to be filled with guys who are the 70th best player in the NBA. Because then so much of it just comes down to churning, to streaming, and volume wins the day every time and being first. And it it just eliminates strategy and fairness and competitiveness, I think. So I reckon you want minimum 150 players rostered. How you figure that out, whether you have... Now, if you have like a 14-team league, I wouldn't suggest necessarily dropping your rosters down to 11. You could. I wouldn't suggest that. And you can go anywhere up to 30 team league. Fantrax allows you to go even higher than that. CBS allows it. Th- Actually, there's a positive for CBS. They do allow 30 team leagues. Yahoo and ESPN only allow up to 20 team leagues. I would always be looking at minimum 150 players. You have to make a decision. Do you want the league to be split into divisions or not? I don't really think in a 10, 12, 14 team league, there's any need for it whatsoever. In larger leagues, yes. 20 and up, I would consider divisions. Otherwise, I don't really think there's much of a need for it. The question that always comes around, when do you finish your league? Well, the NBA season finishes on April the 9th. If you are playing in a rotisserie league, I would finish my league on April the 9th. I would go through to the end of the season. If I'm in a head-to-head league, whether that's categories or a points league, I would not go through to April the 9th. In fact, I would actively avoid going through to April the 9th, and it is the worst fantasy experience you will have, I believe, if you go through and play to the end of the season. 
People will ask me this, and I know that I'll continually get asked this. Josh, when do you recommend ending the fantasy season? I think the last day there should be any fantasy action in a head-to-head league is March the 19th. March the 19th. All right, we'll plaster that wherever you want. March the 19th. Yes, you might push it to March 26th. Tanking, resting, fake injuries really kick off in that last week of March and head through for the final three weeks of the season. March 19th should be your final day of your grand final in your fantasy playoffs, in my opinion. So then that brings your decision. When do you start the playoffs? Or how do you structure the playoffs? Which we'll talk more about in a second. But if you're going to finish on March the 19th and you have a standard three-week playoffs, you start on February the 27th. If you want, and I think the best way to have playoffs, and this this won't appeal to everybody, the best way to have playoffs, I think, is to have two-week matchups. It eliminates um, the issues with schedule imbalances a lot and makes it a little bit fairer to see who the best team is over 14 days versus over seven. The problem with that is if you end the season on March 19th and you have the standard, say, three playoff weeks, that would mean you need six playoff weeks, and that pushes you basically to the start of February. And I don't think you want the playoffs to start that early. So if you do want double playoff weeks, what I would recommend in, say, a standard 12-team league or a 10-team league, instead of having six playoff teams, you have four playoff teams. Top four get in. No need for playoff buys or anything like that. Just the top four get in. And they play starting on February 13th. Now, that, that might that's, might seem like it's a little bit too far out, but it's because the All-Star breaks in there. So you go from February 13th all the way through to March 19th. That's four, four weeks of playoff action. Two rounds, two weeks each round. What's that? Not four weeks. It's four fantasy matchups, which is a, over a period of five weeks. Four matchups over five weeks for your playoffs. You got to make that call of how many play, how many teams are in your playoffs. All right, in a twelve-team league, do you run with six and give the top two buys? Do you run with eight and don't do buys? It's still three weeks. You don't you don't need buys are just so ingrained. Oh, I've got to get that buy. You don't have to have a buy. In fact, having eight playoff teams might actually make your league more competitive down the stretch. Because even the guys towards the bottom, instead of ruling six teams out, you're ruling four teams out. And if four teams don't make the playoffs, that generally means that there might only be two that are out of contention. So consider having an eight-team playoff. Don't have... You don't... We are, Again, it's so ingrained to have a buy. You don't have to have a buy. There's no, there's no rule that says fantasy leagues must have a buy in the first round of the playoffs. No rule at all. In fact, in a, that, it doesn't... We're not... This is not real life, right? Where... Oh, that man, I get that one seed. We get the buy. Our players get to rest. They're still playing in real life. It doesn't actually have... It might have a positive benefit for you, but it might not. It might not. So you don't have to have that buy. I would think... Yeah, again, it depends. The more teams you have in your playoffs, the more competitive your league tends to be towards the end of the season. So if you're running a 16-team league, you can have 10 teams make the playoffs if you want. You could have eight make them. just depends on how many playoff weeks you want. But if you have a 16-team league and four teams make the playoffs, well, a lot of teams are going to be eliminated really early, and it's going to make it tough to make them still engaged towards the end. Do you have a consolation bracket? I, I don't see the need for it. Remember, we are talking about redraft leagues here, but even in a dynasty league, I wouldn't have a consolation bracket. I don't think there is... Actually, you know what? I don't think there is any justification for a consolation bracket at all. You might tell me that the winner of our consolation bracket gets some money. That's fine. The winner of our consolation bracket gets to pick one in next year's draft. That's totally fine as well. We do it to eliminate tanking in dynasties. You have to win that to get a top pick, whatever. I get that. But in a standard redraft league, I really, I really don't see any need for it. I don't see any need for, for those teams to continue. Look, if they, hey, we just want to keep playing fantasy. Okay, I, I get it. But in terms of, I just think if I'm out of the playoffs, I don't really want to keep bothering setting my lineup, especially if I've got multiple leagues and there's other ones I've got to focus on in the playoffs. I don't want to keep doing that or monitoring the waiver wire in my fifth league when I could have cut it down to two or three because the playoffs are on. I really don't see the point 
of a consolation bracket. I, I don't see the necessity for it. I've been playing the season for four and a half months, five months, whatever it is. Uh, those extra two weeks, I, I don't really think that it's necessary. I don't know. You might have different opinions. What do you think on consolation brackets? Um, how many matchups per week? This is more for deeper formats with more teams. Because you can on fan tracks and on CBS. Again, oh, another positive for CBS. Can't do it on Yahoo or ESPN. But you can do it so that your team plays two opponents in a week. Me, team one. I play team two. And I've got that matchup going. But I'm also playing against team three at the same time. And when you're in a league that's deeper, it enables you to get more matchups in. Because if you're in a 20-team league or a 30-team league, you won't play every team during the season. And that leads to an unbalanced schedule. You lucked out and didn't play the top five teams. Well, you can jump straight up there. Right? But in a in a situation where you've got 16 teams, 18 teams, and maybe your regular season goes 14 weeks, you're going to miss out on a couple of teams. But you can set it up where you can play two matchups per week. Which is not a bad, it's not a bad way to go. It's not a bad way to go. Let's look at roster construction. A couple of things I'm passionate about here. Yahoo defaults. We'll talk about defaults in a second. They have two centers. Should never have it. You should not use it. Oh, but Josh, you need it for balance. You, you, actually, you actually don't. And I think the people, or it's what's always happened. The people that argue for this are the people that only use Yahoo. Yahoo is the only site that does it. No other site has has two centers as the default. No other site does it. Centers in the NBA are devalued. There is a high replacement level value, but there's also very limited top-end guys. So what it means when you've got those 12-team league and you need to start two centers every week, you, know, you, you really have to be really pushing down and getting the 24th best center. And you know, who wants to be excited about running out Mason Plumley? in lineups because I've got to have two centers. And people will say, yeah, but then if you only have one center, you only need to play one center. Yeah, but you could also play more of them if you wanted to in the utility slots. But I think forcing the least important position in the NBA or the most fungible position in the NBA, which is center, to have two guaranteed spots where realistically, if I only wanted to play one point guard, I could. I could fill the point guard spot with a point guard, and then I could put shooting guard in a shooting guard spot, shooting guard in the guard spot, and no point guards in utility. I could do the same for shooting guard or small forward or power forward. I only have to play one of those guys. But center, I have to play two, and that just doesn't make sense to me. And again, Yahoo has always done this. Nobody else, no other site does this. It is not a standard fantasy thing. It is a Yahoo thing. And that takes me on to ESPN. They, for some reason, when you start a league, have a default that you can only have four centers on your roster. Like Yahoo goes, please, please, more centers. And ESPN goes, actually, we want fewer centers. So someone's wrong, or actually they're both wrong. There is absolutely no need for a position requirement, a maximum position requirement. Absolutely none. The first thing you do when you set up an ESPN league is remove the maximum position of four, which is what they said, where you can only have four centers on your roster. And then they use some arbitrary thing. If a player is listed power forward slash center, they're not considered a center. But if they're listed center slash power forward, they are considered a center, whatever their primary position is. So that comes down to whatever one bloke is assigning these positions. And that random bloke might come out and say, well, you know, Carl Anthony Towns is going to be listed as a center now, even though we all know he's going to be the power forward this season. So make that arbitrary decision has such a big impact on the way leagues get set up. Position eligibility is a really frustrating thing for me right across the board because, you know, oh, Nikola Jokic, power forward center, cool. How many power forward minutes has he played in the last three minutes? Well, three, three years, probably zero, but we still give him that title for no reason whatsoever. Four center max on ESPN needs to go. Two centers starting in a Yahoo lineup needs to go. All right, you shouldn't have either of those things. Active versus bench. Figure it out. Like, you gotta, you got to make that call. In general, in general, the, the more, the, the higher the active to bench ratio that you have, the more active your waiver wire can become. Because the larger bench you have, the more you're able to stash people. Because you don't have to use them. 
Like if you have five players who are active and eight on the bench, I don't need to rotate guys through to get games played. I can just sit those players there. All right, and therefore, I'll grab someone off the wire and they can sit there for 10 weeks and I never have to use them. And then I wait for an injury to happen and then they get pushed into a large role and I use them. And it limits your wave wire activity. That can be a good or a bad thing. Depends on how you want to set your league up. But that's one of the consequences of changing the active to bench ratio. In general, I think you want... yeah. It depends on the roster size, but you want like 75% active usually. Between 75 to 80% active, I think, is a good number to have as active versus bench. I think having that extra, and we'll talk about this in a second, having the extra bench is pretty good. And I would always, and that's what the ne- well, one of the next points is there. Should it be 13 or 14-man rosters as a standard? I think it should be 14. That's what Fantrax does. Yahoo and ESPN do 13. I'll tell you why I think it should be 14. Because why? In a standard draft, when you're snaking, which we'll talk about soon as well, when you're snaking, why should the team that picks number one overall get to pick first in seven rounds and last in six rounds? They already get the advantage. And why does the team that picks last in round one have to pick last in seven rounds and first in six rounds? Just make it even. I think having the 10-4 split, 10 active, 4 bench, is the perfect way to go. Injured reserve. You need... You need minimum two, I think. I don't like the situation. Oh, it's great. We don't have injured reserve. So therefore, at we, you know, if Kevin Durant gets injured for three weeks, you've got to, you've got to make the call to, um, you know, do you drop him? Do you keep him? You know what that does? All that does is benefit the teams at the top of the standings. Because if you are sixth and you've got Kevin or seventh and you've got Kevin Durant, he's out for four weeks or Steph Curry at the end of last season, whatever, you know, he's out you, and you drop him. The team who's sitting pretty at the top You know what they can do? They can afford to take on that injured player, sit them on their bench, and if they cop a couple of 3-6 matchup losses or a couple of matchup losses, right, it doesn't matter for them. They're still going to make the playoffs. And then when that player comes back, the person who's sitting on the top of, of the standings gets immeasurably stronger. I don't think there's any reason that you should have a situation where players are forced to drop top ranking players because of injury. I think you need two to three injured reserve slots. And if you're on Yahoo, it's got to be IL+. plus. You can't be sitting there waiting for someone to arbitrarily change their status from O to IL. And I know there can be hacks with, oh, yeah, people are listed game time decisions and they're questionable. You can move them in and out. That's, that's all well and good. I would much prefer that versus waiting for someone to arbitrarily change change the injured status so that you can act to put them onto IR. If someone gets hurt, I want to put them on IR. There is no injured reserve in the NBA. It's not like the NFL when someone goes on injured reserve, it's an official designation. There is no injured reserve in the NBA. There is no nothing like that. So if someone is hurt and they're on an injury report, you should be able to put them in the injured spot. I think that that to me feels pretty straightforward and I think it's best for the mechanics of the game as well. Positions. Do you do specific positions? Do you do soft positions or do you positionless? Well, that's a decision you can make. Specific positions, I mean point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, center. Soft positions just means guards, forward, center. Positionless means everyone's a utility. I've never played in a league where everyone's been a utility, but I actually don't have a problem with it. I think it leads to a little bit more strategy, to be honest. And I don't, yeah, I don't, all of the defaults on Yahoo and ESPN are like point guard, shooting guard, small four. Yeah, I don't know that that's really where we need to be going. Um, I just realized there was something I forgot about talking about at the start when that was most categories versus each category in category leagues. Probably should have spoken about it. Maybe I'll talk about it at the end. That's, yeah, I, I think you should know what that is, but I'll go back and talk about it. Oh, no, yeah, I'll talk about it soon. Let's look at what the standard rosters look like. Yahoo, point guard, shooting guard, guard. Small forward, power forward, forward, center, center, two utilities, and three bench. ESPN goes point guard, shooting guard, guard. Small forward, power forward, forward, center. Utility three, bench three. Fantrax goes guard, four. Forwards, four. Centers, one. Utility, one. Bench, four. Hmm. They're just 
Again, I don't like the Yahoo two centers. I don't mind the fan tracks. I'd prefer extra utilities, maybe three guard, three forward, three utility in a center. That's probably my best, best look at it, I reckon. Gives you more flexibility. When we, oh, sorry, yeah, talking about just back to the category stuff again, out of order. Sorry, screwed it up. Talking about the categories, most versus each category. Each category means that when you win a category league, like if I beat you in threes, I get one. If I beat you in free throws, I get one. If you beat me in field goals, you get one. And we have matchup scores at the end of the week, 6-3, 5-4, 7-2, 7-4 seven, in an 11-cat league, whatever it is. Most categories means all I need to do is beat you in the majority of categories. So in a nine-cat league, I just need to win five categories. And if I do, I get one win. I tend to like each category more because it rewards teams who are more dominant. You get higher scores, but it also leads to more abilities to catch up. You have a big week and you can jump in the standings. Because if you, if you beat a team 9-0 in a most categories, you get the same as someone who wins 5-4. There's actually no real benefit to that. If you win a 9-0 and someone else gets a 5-4, you can catch them. You can jump over them. So I think each, each category is by far my preferred format. Let's look at limits. What do I mean? Well, in Roto, you always want to set a games played limit. For each active slot, 82 games played. 82 games played, game cap. So when you talk game cap Roto format, you want 82 games Per spot. You can actually set it to 84 if you want 85. I don't mind that. All right, just gives you a little bit more streaming or rotation ability. And in general, when you're playing a roto league like that, I tend to go under the pace. So if someone gets hurt, I don't automatically switch someone in because towards the end of the season, then I try to stream some guys in when some bigger roles have appeared and guys are maybe getting hurt that I can then try to catch up and really go aggressive on the streaming. Also, people can make limits of... Um, in head-to-head -head leagues. Now, this is not an option on Yahoo, but it is on Fantrax and it is on um, ESPN. We can have games played limit for the week. In general, if I'm doing this, I like to set it to around 3.8, around that mark, a bit under four, per active slot. So you've got 10 active slots. To me, the maximum per week should be 38. The lower you make that number, whether it's 34 active games per week, the lower you make that number, the less active the waiver wire becomes, the bench becomes more of a stash zone because you just don't have to use it and cycle through it as much. I think with a 3.8 per active slot, that means that basically everyone on your active roster, so to speak, is going to be used throughout the week. Now, I know people will have complaints. Oh, but what the sites do is that if you get to, you know, 38 your maximum for the week, and if, but if you get to 37 by Saturday, then you can just go over on Sunday. That is true. You can do that. But I don't actually see too much of a problem with that because there are ways to limit the overall impact of that. You know, it's not like teams are going to say, well, I'm dropping everybody and playing 10 guys on a Sunday. It's just, it's not a realistic scenario that, that does happen to blow you out of the water in one matchup. It's just not, it's not a realistic situation until you get to the actual final, then everyone does it. Um, there are also, people sometimes run limits. We'll talk about this with transactions. Actually. We'll, we'll talk transactions. Lineup locks. You can have daily leagues where you change your lineup every day. And there are two different types of those where before the first game tips, usually at 7 p.m., but on Sunday it can be earlier. Before that line, before that lineup or that first game tips, you've got to set your lineup for the day. So you've got to make decisions. If someone's questionable, do you put them in? Do you keep them out? There are other situations where you can make changes to your active lineup up until that player's game starts. So if you've got LeBron and he's questionable and he starts and he plays in a 10 p.m. Eastern time tip-off game, you've got until that game tips before you move him in or out or move, say you've got um, whoever the replacement might be. Let's say it's Lonnie Walker. You think it's going to get a big usage bump because LeBron's out, but he's on your bench. You don't know whether you're going to play him or start him because you've got weekly limits or roto limits or whatever. But once you hear LeBron's out at 9 p.m. Eastern, the other games have all started, LeBron moves out of your lineup. Lonnie Walker moves in. Then there's weekly, where at the start of the week, you set your lineup, and that's it. You can't change it. It's great for convenience. It's bad for injuries. And then there's semi-weekly, where uh, this is only an option on fan tracks, where you can do it twice during the week. You can make one change to your lineup during the week. It's, a, it's an interesting 
maneuver, an interesting idea. I still prefer daily changes leagues, but it's an interesting, interesting situation. Let's talk about transactions. I think having a transaction limit is a really good idea. A really good idea. And oh, also, let me try that again. I think it's a really good idea for a weekly transaction limit. Whether that's five ads for the week, four, seven. I think seven's probably too many. I think four was probably the right number before we had all the COVID absences. At this point, I think five additions for a week is probably the right amount. Combined with um, improvements in injured reserve numbers. I think five ads for the week is probably right. Some people do it. We have 50 ads for the season. I don't particularly like that style. I don't, I don't like a season limit, but it is something you can do. This show's going longer than I expected. That's all right. Um, free agency, adding players. You've got three real options. First come, first served. That just means a player gets dropped. Whoever sees them on the waiver, I can go and add them. Simple as that. Rewards people who are more active. Rewards people who are in time zones that might be reflected based on when Yahoo decides it's a, you're available to pick them up. Again, a system that I hate on Yahoo. Um, you got the waiver wire system where when a player gets dropped, they go for a period of time, usually it's 48 hours, where they sit on waivers. And what that means is that everyone has an opportunity to add that player, but the priority is based on you know, waiver priority. And generally, that waiver priority gets set based on the initial um, fantasy draft where the team that picked last in the first round gets first waiver priority. Now, one of the things that annoys me a lot in fantasy is people holding on. Man, I've got waiver one. I've got waiver priority one. I'm not going to use it. And they hold it and hold it and hold it and hold it. And they never actually utilize having this first position in waiver order. I think that waiver order should reset every week. So whoever the worst team is, they then become waiver priority one. I don't like the idea of someone just sitting and sitting and sitting because it not that it necessarily advantages them. I think it disadvantages them and it actually makes the league a little bit less interesting when someone's just not making the right moves or not taking the risk because they want to hold onto this so desperately. I think that waiver priority should reset every single week. So what your waiver is, your player's out there. I say, oh, I want to grab him. You say, you want to grab him whichever one of us has a higher waiver priority ends up getting that player. The last system you use is FAB, free agent auction budget, where you get a certain amount of fake money, 100 bucks, 200 bucks, whatever it is, whatever number you want. A player is out there. And let's say it is the aforementioned Lonnie Walker. And I go, wow, Lonnie Walker's really proved me wrong. And now he's at least an average NBA player. And I want to go and add him. All right, I can't just go grab him and put him onto my team. I've got to say, well, okay, he's out there. Let's make a move. Um... I'll say he's worth $3. And then you come out and play a bit. You don't know how much I put on. You put him on and say, I've got $2. There's a set time each day when all these bids process. I got three. You got two. I get him. I spend $3. So my $100 free agent budget goes down to $97. But I've got Lonnie Walker now. The downside of that is, is that it makes it hard that if you know, an hour before game time, you see that, I don't want to use LeBron again, but let's say that Jakob Pertl is out. You go, man, I really want to stream Zach Collins in for today. You can't because the free agents process once every day. You can use a mix of this thing where the players who get released to waivers, you bid on those guys via fab and anyone who clears that 48 hour period then becomes just first come first served, which is not a bad method. But the fab situation eliminates like, hey, I live on the West Coast, therefore I'm awake when things process. Or I live in Europe, so when games are on, I don't actually know what's going on and I, I'm disadvantaged. It eliminates like, am I awake and active when news breaks? Therefore I benefit. That's what having that set fab does. Yahoo also has a setting where it's today or tomorrow. If I add a player, I can't use them for two days. A nonsense setting. Every should be free agent acquisition. I don't know the exact wording because again, I can't open Yahoo to look at it. Um, it should always just be today. If I add someone on Tuesday, I should be able to play them on Wednesday. But the tomorrow setting is I add someone on Tuesday, I can't play them to Thursday. Silly setting. Um, as I said here, weekly max or season max. I talked about that already. Um, I have to decide at the start of the year if teams 
when the playoffs are on and you, whether you've got consolation brackets or not, can teams who are not in the playoffs make transactions? Can they do ads and drops? I think if you do have a consolation bracket, which I don't agree with, but if you do have a consolation bracket, then yes, everyone can make moves. If you don't have a consolation bracket, then there is absolutely no excuse for any team out of the playoffs for be ma- making free agent moves. So that I just don't think consolation bracket should be there. Therefore, teams out of the playoffs shouldn't make free agent moves. Trading. Should you have league vetoes? I know, I, I know, I know. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Locked On. Should you have league v- vetoes? Oh, fuck off. Hey, fuck off. Absolutely not. Never, ever, ever have league votes for trades. Never. The nonsense that goes down in those votes, I don't like it because his team got better. Oh, well, you know what? Bad luck. Who cares? Not your problem, not your business. Oh, well, that's actually not a fair trade, so that shouldn't go through. You know what? Also, none of your business. There is a commissioner or a panel of commissioners that you have that can look over trades. But their job is not to say, well, that's a fair trade. And if we balance the fantasy points and the rankings on Basketball Monster to, to do the... Like, no, the trades go through. Unless you look at it and it's Jokic for Lonnie Walker and you go, all right, hold up. What on earth are you guys doing? Somebody here is cheating. Which, why are you cheating? I This trade, you're cheating. Do one more like this and you're kicked out and you lose your money. That is what the commissioner veto is for. If the trade is Nikola Jokic for Damian Lillard and Kyrie Irving, you let it go through. But someone will go, there's no way Lillard might get hurt again. And Kyrie, who knows? He's never going to be there. You can't trade the number one player, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, not your problem. Not your business. Not your problem. Commissioners, let it through. Collusion trades are very... People might think they're slick. They're very obvious to see. And having a commission who understands that, it's very obvious. Every trade needs to be approved by a commissioner. But 99% of them just get approved. You're You're not there to be the arbiter of team decisions. You're not there to be the person who says, imagine the NBA had someone like this. Troy Weaver, my guy. You cannot sign Marvin Bagley to three years, $37 million guaranteed. Are you insane? We are voiding that contract because you've lost your mind. That's, that's the same idea. You can't have that. You can't have people voting on it and you can't have a commissioner saying, oh, you know what? I'm actually not sure this trade's in your best interest. Not your, not your business, not your job, none of it. The trades go through unless it's cheating and it is super obvious to see. But what if it ruins the balance of the league? Oh, well. You know what? If someone is making a, a trade which you think is bad, which again is subjective, much like the best player available argument earlier on in the day, it can be very subjective. But unless there is... And, and you just just ask them, hey, what are you? What's your reasoning here? And if the logic makes no sense and it smells, then get rid of it. That's your job as commissioner. Should have a trade deadline, and it should be about three to four weeks, I think, or at least three weeks before the fantasy playoffs start. And you got to decide whether you want to have the ability to trade draft picks. I'm not on the fence with that. Whatever, have it. Don't have it. Doesn't matter. These are settings which are available on fan tracks, not everywhere. Do you want salaries or contracts? Do you want real salaries? These are more applicable to dynasty leagues, but you can do a redraft league where the real salary of a player is included and you've got to fit your roster under the salary cap. It's a little bit more advanced, but we're not really going to talk about that here. Then you've got to talk about your draft. What do you want to do? Standard snake draft, a third round reversal draft, which means that the team that picks first in round two also picks first in round three. And then they pick first in round five, seven, nine, like that. So basically the order just reverses in round three and then continues on. So it means the person who picks last in round one at pick 12, also picks at pick 13, and also picks at pick 25, versus 12, 13, 36. Gives them a boost for not getting that high pick. Or there's a salary cap draft, slash auction draft, which again is is an option. It takes longer, it's way more fair, and it's a lot more rewarding and fun. It's a lot harder though. They're your three main options. Do you want a slow draft? If you're going to draft now, you can do it where there's four hours per pick. I wouldn't draft now, but you might start in September and say, we'll do it over four weeks. You've got four hours to make your pick. Fantrax offers that option. Or you can do you know, a fast one with standard. You've got 45 seconds, you've got a minute, you've got a minute 30, whatever it is. Set your timer. 
What do you do if there's auto picks? If someone misses one of their picks, do you just automatically stick them on auto? Do you give them two missed picks? Make that call yourself. And the last thing I want to talk about is prizes. How do you distribute your prizes? You've got to decide this before the start of the season. Do I give um, 50% to the winner, 30% to the runner-up, and then 10% to the third and fourth team? Do I give everyone in the playoffs some money? Is it winner take all? Do I give 50% of the prize money to the playoff winner and 50% of the prize money to the team that finished with the best regular season record? There's lots of ways to do it, but you've got to decide all this sort of stuff before the season. Is there a penalty for the last place team? Are they kicked out of the league? Do they have to then pay $50 to the winner? Like, work out what... Do you have to do something embarrassing and film it and post it on social media, whatever? Figure out your prizes and penalties before the season starts. And that, I think is a pretty, I don't know, comprehensive guide to setting up a fantasy league. I'm sure I missed something. If I did, drop it in the comments below and I'll get back and chat to you about it. Follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on Odyssey. On YouTube, thumb it up, leave your comments. Guys, we're done. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.